I had always idolized England because I think you, if you're an English major especially, you think that here it all began and you want to walk under Milton's mulberry tree at Cambridge and you remember all the Dickens that you read when you were little and suddenly you go to London and you recognize scenes that you have somehow seen before. And this is simply, I think, a sort of literary influence. I remembered all sorts of little queer crannies and peculiar of views in London, that, and I seemed to be visiting them again, and I was immensely excited by the historic sense of London in the first place, and then by the look of it, something about all the taxi cabs being black and, and rather like large impressive hearses, and then the double-decker buses, simple things and quite obvious things, but these really I found quite overwhelming at first. And I loved everybody being so courteous, that was another thing, sort of old-world formality about everybody from the bobbies to the postman. And finally, we found that, that this is where we wanted to live, and there were all sorts of considerations that made this decision a possible one. We lead a rather peculiar life, both of us being writers and poets, and have, a, have a peculiar demands, therefore. And England somehow seemed a great deal more hospitable to a couple of artists who wanted to be artists and at the same time lead a very normal and rather placid family life. And I think, again, that this is something which would be much more difficult in America. The pressure for an artist, especially one that's not commercial, to get a job, to get a regular job that then turns out to exhaust his energies, to take all his time and so on, is so great that it's almost impossible to resist it. Also, it's very difficult to find the sort of combination that we seem to have found in England of living in the country, really the deep country, because uh, the voices around that you hear are mainly cows and sheep, and yet being able to get to London in a day and have a whole day in London doing what one wishes and then come back, you see, by nightfall and for supper. The weather infects me, uh, affects me, I say infects me, it really does infect me. Uh, weather affects me intensely. I find that I just don't observe it. I, I can't uh, make the best of it the way many people can. And I know that when I came to England, I heard with joy that no place in England was more than 70 miles from the sea. So I demanded immediately that my husband take me to the sea, which happened to be Yorkshire in the vicinity of Whitby. And we drove in pouring rains through very depressing red brick rows and rows of red brick houses that were um, what they call what? They're undetached. They're not even semi-detached. They're just undetached. They come in long cut paper rows. And these houses led up to the sea, which was a sort of muddy, gray-blue wash in the rain. And there were a great many people walking on boardwalks in plastic-colored raincoats, eating out of little paper parcels sandwiches. And these people were on holiday, and they were having a seaside holiday, and they were living in little inns. And I, I really was astounded by this, because it rained perpetually, and there was a kind of litter underfoot of little gum wrappers and so on. And I was so intensely depressed by this vision of the sea that um, I retreated inland rapidly, and I, I really haven't been out again, although I'm hoping to, to discover something in Cornwall nearby this, this coming summer when we may have some sunshine. Another of the, the reasons I, I particularly like living in England is that it, it's rather the place I'd, I'd uh, most prefer bringing up my children. I think in this way I'm a bit old-fashioned. I find, uh, and my husband found in America, that the children are somehow um, let have com almost completely free reign. And I feel in England that there is still a bit of the Victorian element that, that children somehow have to fit into to the adult's life rather than the poor flustered adult trying to fit their life madly around, around these, these um, rampaging children. Well, I particularly like the English butcher shops. I'd never seen anything like them in America. To get meat, I've walked up a counter while Muzak was playing tender melodies and picked out a cut of red beef that had cellophane over it and told me exactly how much it weighed and exactly how much it cost and I would pay for this and, and go out with my um, parcels and the door would fly open for me of its own accord and that would be that. But in England, when I wanted to get a pork chop, I walked into a butcher's shop and I was astounded at first because I had never seen pigs at such close quarters, whole pigs and half pigs 
and pieces of pigs, and I didn't know what to ask for. I knew I wanted a pork chop, but I didn't know what it was until I saw it, until I saw it wrapped up in cellophane and labeled. And I, I stood at the counter, and I remember feeling very, very faint and rather wobbly, and these, these pigs kept turning themselves off and on, these large, rather horribly colored pink pigs. And it took me a while to get used to walking in in cold blood and seeing the butcher taking down half a pig and cutting precisely the cut I wanted by some marvelous intuition. And I have since become devoted to the British butcher shops. And I'm, I'm not by any means an expert, but I think you have to know your cuts of meat. And it's a rather creative process to choose them out of the animal almost on the hoof. And I think this is an experience that I, I really was deprived of in America. One of the things that I, I think I like most about the English is their, their ability to be eccentric, to be themselves to such an extent that they're strikingly different from anybody else. I know when I went first to stay at, at uh, an English home, I was fascinated. I wanted to see what this was like. And I went in, and I remember the mother was doing needlepoint. And I thought this was a charming English thing. And I went over, and she was doing a needlepoint of penicillium mold. And I saw that on the footstools, instead of cozy roses or something of that sort, she had done needlepoint of rattlesnakes' backs. And I was rather fascinated by this. And I remember particularly when I was going to bed at night, she very seriously offered me my choice of a hot water bottle or a cat. She didn't have enough hot water bottles to go around or enough cats to go around, but if she used both of them, they came out even. And I chose the cat. <laughs>